Welcome to our next session, which will explore how society, culture, and religion influence the social connectedness and disconnection within ourselves and that of our nation. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce these experts and thought leaders who will dive into layers of the human experience. Our first speaker is Tyler Vanderweel, Professor of Epidemiology in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Director of the Human Flourishing Program and co-director of the Initiative on Health, Religion, and Spirituality at Harvard University. His empirical research spans psychiatric and social epidemiology, the science of happiness and flourishing, and the study of religion and health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vanderweel to the Action Forum. Well, thank you, Juliana. It's a pleasure being here today. I will be speaking about um, the role of religious communities in shaping a sense of social connectedness and health and well-being. In short, uh, human flourishing. I will talk about both the role of religious communities with regard to being an important form of social connection and community involvement, but also uh, its effects on health and well-being. I'll spend some of the time talking about uh, the most rigorous research on this topic and also about the implications of this work. How can we promote uh, social connectedness through religious community, specifically through the lens of my own uh, disciplines, public health and medicine? So if we could move on to the slides. Um, so there are now over uh, 10,000 quantitative studies on religion and health summarized um, in the Handbook of Religion and Health, the uh, next edition of which will be out in December, but I, I do want to discuss with all of this research, what is it that we really know? Um, does religious community really cause these effects on health and on well-being, on social connection? Um, and to establish causation, we need to focus on the most rigorous studies. We want studies that look at effects over time to establish causation. We want to be able to control for other factors so we can rule out that these aren't just uh, personality driving everything. Uh, we want to, studies over time so that we can control for, for baseline outcomes. So for example, if religious service attendance is associated with lower depression, is that because it prevents depression or is it because depressed people withdraw from religious communities? We need studies over time to establish this. And ideally we want multiple studies in different contexts, synthesizing uh, the evidence. Next slide, please. Um, so what is it that we really know? Well, if you look at these successive editions of this handbook on religion and health, these handbooks summarize the totality of the evidence, but there have been some distinct important points, some distinct meta-analyses restricting evidence to the most rigorous studies. Uh, please go back. Um, and um, one of these, for example, suggests that uh, looking over to do dozens of studies that regular religious service attendance reduces the risk of all-cause mortality over the next 10 years by about 27 percent. Uh, with regard to depression, that reduction is about 33 percent. And again, this is restricting to the most um, rigorous evidence. Next slide, please. And evidence isn't restricted just to these outcomes. In one of our studies using data from uh, Harvard's Nurses Health Study looking at about 90,000 women um, over 14 year period, we found that uh, regular participation reduced the risk of suicide by about 84%. Next slide, please. Um, and there's similar rigorous evidence um, for, for, for other outcomes as well, not just mortality and depression and suicide, but also for happiness and life satisfaction, for meaning and purpose, uh, for less substance abuse, less crime, greater generosity, volunteering, civic engagement, pro-social behavior, and of course, also social connectedness, relationships, improving marital stability. It's not applicable across all outcomes, cardiovascular disease incidents, anxiety, evidence is, is less clear, but for many important health and well-being outcomes, including social connectedness, I'd say the evidence from the most rigorous longitudinal studies is now quite strong. So what are we to make of all of this? Next slide, please. Well, I'd like to address the implications of this research briefly, both from a public health perspective and a clinical perspective. Is it ever really appropriate to, to try to promote uh, participation in a uh, religious community? And if so, under, under what circumstances and what uh, context? How might we do this in an ethical and sensible manner? And how should we think about this in the context of popu population health and well-being? With regard to public health perspectives, the public health impact 
of um, an intervention or phenomena is often assessed as a function of two things. On the one hand, the prevalence of the exposure or phenomena we're studying, how common is it? Um, and on the other hand, the, the size of its effects, something that's common in the population and has strong effects on the outcomes that we care about will shape population health and well-being. With regard to religious participation, about 84% of the world's population identifies with a religious tradition. Within the United States, 89% believe in God, 78% consider religion to be a very important or fairly important part of life, 79% identify with a particular religious group, 36% report having attended a religious service in the last week. As we've seen previously, the effect sizes on health, on well-being, on social connection are also large. So religious participation is going to shape population health. And if we neglect it, we will be missing one of the important forces shaping population health and well-being. Next slide, please. As an example of this, the uh, Center for Disease Control has expressed considerable concern over the rising suicide rate in the United States. Uh, that rate rose from 10.5 per 100,000 per year in 1999 to 13 per 100,000 per year in 2014. Uh, during the same period, the Gallup poll indicated a 43% decline in religious participation, uh, sorry, uh, part decline in religious participation from 43% in 1999 to 36% in 2014. If one were to take the estimate of the effect of participation in suicide from our study and extrapolate that to the general population, it would suggest that about 40% of that increase in suicide rate was in fact due to declining uh, attendance. And this is still being missed in major public health discussions on suicide and the trends shaping suicide. If we ignore religious communities as a factor that's creating social connectedness, alleviating loneliness and affecting health outcomes, we will be missing some of the picture. Um, so is it ever really appropriate um, to, 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 to encourage or, or, or promote this? Next slide, please. So there I want to turn to, to clinical practice. Should questions of religion and spirituality be addressed within medicine? Is it ever appropriate to encourage service attendance? And I do think we need to be uh, careful here. In a very provocative piece published about 20 years ago, Richard Sloan and colleagues um, argued that um, we, we probably shouldn't address this in medicine, that the endorsement of service attendance is premature and unethical. It can cause tensions and antagonism. Physicians aren't, aren't trained to do this. We should um, we should avoid such discussions within clinical contexts. Um, but there have been, I think, reasonable responses to this, um, that, that you know, these critics are really setting up a straw man, um, that no one's suggesting physicians prescribe religious service attendance. And this is really different than a recognition that such activities can be meaningful in certain patients' lives and in their understanding of, of, of illness, that one can potentially take a short spiritual history. And for those who aren't religious or spiritual, the discussion can quickly move on. Next slide, please. Um, and, and so one can um, ask simple questions like, are religion and spirituality important to you in thinking about health or illness or at other times? Or do you have or would you like to have someone to talk to um, about spiritual matters? These questions can be asked even if a patient and clinician uh, differ in, in religious views and can give the patient freedom to address these questions in a clinical context. Many patients feel this is a very important part of, of their experience. Uh, patients, for example, uh, will re rate to religion and spirituality as one of the top two out of seven factors in their own medical decision making, whereas physicians rank it seventh out of seven. But given that it plays such a prominent role in patient decision making, it arguably should be addressed. And once again, a simple spiritual history can make that clear for a particular patient. Next slide, please. Uh, but is it ever ethical to really encourage this form of community participation? I do think we need to acknowledge that decisions about religious participation are generally not made uh, based on, on health. That religious commitments are typically shaped by, by experiences, by upbringing, values, truth claims, evidence, relationships, systems of, of meaning, uh, and so on. One does want to purely instrumentalize uh, notions of religion and spirituality. Um, but I think for those who do already positively self-identify with a religious tradition, it would not be unethical to encourage attendance as a form of meaningful social participation. If someone already holds these beliefs or identifies with a tradition, encouraging community uh, involvement, I think, is an important resource to contribute to health, well-being, and social connectedness. Uh, certainly, context needs to be taken into consideration. Those who have had negative experiences or even abuse within religious uh, context, I think those situations need to be handled carefully. But once again, taking a spiritual history might help unveil such negative experiences. 
um, and with appropriate referrals then being made as needed. Next slide, please. So I do think a reasonable approach, even within clinical practice, might be to take a brief um, spiritual history, religious service attendance could be encouraged for those who already positively self-identify with a religious tradition. Other forms of community involvement could be encouraged uh, for those who, who, who do not. Um, but we've seen in our health and well-being studies that some form of community participation is especially important. The effects tend to be larger with religious communities than other forms of community life, but are very powerful for other forms of community life as well. And then once again, for those who have had negative experiences with religious communities, offers could be made to and referrals made to chaplains or other counselors to um, address these difficulties. Um, so again, I think the research evidence indicates powerful effects of religious participation on health, on well-being, on social connectedness. I think this is an important resource for many people, not everyone, but for many people, and one that we should not neglect. And um, I think we can also turn the question around, given the effects of attendance that cross so many outcomes are so profound, are we doing harm in withholding this information? It's my presentation. Thank you all for listening. It truly is a pleasure being here today. Join me in thanking Dr. Vanderweel for that wonderful, informative presentation. I'm thrilled to welcome to the stage our next speakers, Reverend Dr. Gary Gunderson and Dr. Teresa T.C. Cutts. Reverend Dr. Gary Gunderson is a professor at both the School of Medicine and School of Divinity at Wake Forest University. He serves as Vice President of Faith Health for Atrium Wake Forest Health, responsible for a division that includes counselors, chaplains, and varieties of community health workers, and weavers focused on connecting the torn social fabric and safety nets in our troubled time. Dr. Cutts is faculty at the Wake Forest School of Medicine's Public Health Science Sciences Division, where she serves as a researcher and program developer for the Faith Health Division. She also holds appointments in the Maya Angelou Center for Health Equity. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gunderson and Dr. Cutts to the stage. Hey, thank you, Jill. And uh, thank you, Tyler, for what a brilliant um, uh, framing of this, of this broad subject. Um, because of, uh, of Tyler's uh, brilliance on, on the data, we're really gonna lean into the practice side of the discussion. Um, both uh, TC and I, you can see we're married, we're in our dining room. Um, the, um, we, we, we play some role in the academic side of this, but uh, our day job is actually focused on more on the so what, what do you do with all this stuff? And we have the privilege of being located uh, much of our work at, uh, in Memphis at uh, Methodist Healthcare, uh, uh, which is a faith-based um, uh, academic medical center. We were recruited here to Wake Forest about 10 years ago. Uh, the Baptist started this one, not the Methodist. Uh, but at the core of this system is a, is a Baptist hospital, which for 100 years came out of the religious networks. And still at our, at our centennial, uh, part of our core strategy for population health and community health and patient care and quality of care uh, actually involves an active, intentional, systematic uh, relationship with all of the different types of faith that live on the ground here in North Carolina. It's important to say all of the types of faith. Uh, there is no more religiously diverse institution from none to every possible type of tradition that you find uh, in an academic medical center. That's certainly true at Wake Forest. Uh, the slide before you is sort of an org chart. <clears throat> at the center of it is the logo for CareNet, which is a network of 37 counseling centers across the state of North Carolina. Our counselors are state certified uh, licensed counselors, but uh, we also give them a two-year residency. So they're competent. <clears throat> and experienced and skilled in dealing with uh, some of the spiritual dynamics of a journey of health, including, including the, the traumas of life that uh, Tyler uh, uh, pointed to in his data. Uh, many of these counselor centers were starting by religious congregations who were trying to bring the best of 20th century, now 21st century <clears throat> science to bear on the challenges their neighbors face. And so we have a 
Care Net Counseling Center. Uh, we also have 70,000 people who work for uh, Atrium uh, all across uh, our three states. <clears throat> um, if you look around this slide, the one I really want to focus on that Tyler's data pointed to the most uh, is actually on the far right slide. You'll see we have 3,033 clergy who are registered to visit our patients in the in the hospital. Uh, we know the number is accurate because we give them free parking. And uh, it's not actually free. My division gets billed for it. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty sure that's an accurate number. But what, a, what an extraordinary number of people who actually are uh, on, a, on a regular basis engaging um, in a supportive manner uh, with very different levels of competence and very different ideas about what does God have to do with one's health. But this is a huge body of people who we do not pay, but they're in the lives of people we call patients. Uh, we can document there are about 543 congregations who had shared in, a, in an episode of care for one of our patients. And so I'm just sort of stressing for us the very practical nature of building these networks of shared trust uh, into the community. And this is true even at a time when the, uh, for, for many individuals, congregations and religiosity um, has been politicized, dare I say, weaponized in the public sphere to where, you know, it's hard to tell if you, if you walk in somebody's room and you're identified as a religious person or, you know, they're a religious person, you're not sure what that religion part of their identity means. It, it may be a proxy for their political identity uh, and it may not be. So there's a requirement uh, for really sensitive training for our professional chaplains uh, so that they understand both the toxic as well as positive nature of religious identity. Um, <clears throat> the point I'm really making is this is like daytime work. Uh, this is not ideation. This is, we have uh, hundreds of people who are trained and focused, not just inside the academic medical center, but actually to the furthest reach of the smallest little road uh, in what is about 88 counties of North Carolina. We we, we go to where the people are and we try to take advantage of the social religious assets that are there in their lives. Let's flip to the next slide. I felt a sermon coming on, so I'm <laughs> going to try to prevent that. <clears throat> uh, TC and I were in India uh, at a World Council of Churches conference on uh, trying to focus on uh, how do we bring mental health more into the heart of ministries of the global webs of the Christian churches, the World Council. And we looked out our window and this was a, this was a telephone pole uh, across which a telephone message that we had, we had called back to the States from, uh, from Valor, India. That's the telephone pole the message went through. And <clears throat> I love this slide because it simply makes the point when you're talking about building social connection, this is much more what it's going to look like than these beautiful org charts and clean job descriptions and competencies and data and evidence. This is, this is the way human beings actually connect. And so this is a statement just, just to remind us of the radical complexity of how humans manage to figure out how to talk to each other and care for each other and come into each other's presence. Let's flip to the next slide. Uh, one of the metaphors I love when we talk about social connection and uh, networks of, of faith and non-faith and meaning <clears throat> is the fibroblast. Uh, when I was injured uh, in a uh, so-called sports injury, I don't know if you call it a sports injury when you're over 60, but um, I fell down on the tennis court and, and came to learn about fibroblast because my academically gifted wife uh, knew I had to understand what was going on in my body to be a good partner with my body. And I came to learn about the miracle of fibroblasts and that they were rushing to the point of injury even before I would have had any capacity to even know where the injury was. The fibroblasts in our, in our body do that. I think there's something like that uh, metaphor that, that works for the way uh, isolation and loneliness is often dealt with in actual human communities. There's usually somebody, I'm looking out my window right now at Shelly across the street, our neighbor. She probably would be the fibroblast in our, in our condo development because she always knows who's hurting, who's lonely, 
And somehow or another, she manages to come like a fibroblast into that relationship and make it happen. She doesn't go to church. She's a Jewish neighbor who, you know, is just in people's lives. And uh, But she functions like the fibroblast in our little micro geography here. And I suspect there's something like that. I'm going to talk a little bit later after TC brings some of the data about the way in which uh, the issue of loneliness heightens our awareness, not only of what is not their relationship, it also heightens the relationship of the way relationship comes to be in actual normal human communities, not just through systematic planning, interventional, medicalized kind of programs, but actually life itself is sort of working through our relational capacities to build what looks like it's missing. I want to go to the next slide because it actually <clears throat> makes the point. Fibroblasts don't travel by themselves. Uh, this is what I like to think of as a congregation of fibroblasts. And this is the way it actually works in our body. So it's a metaphor, but this is what's actually going on inside us right at this moment. And I think the metaphor is a little bit the way I imagine how how congregations, not in their formality, but in the way that these are already webs of relationship that are actively seeking out uh, people who are lonely and isolated. The prayer list of the women's prayer group who may be meeting in our congregation, who they pray for, are not the ones who are present. They pray for the ones who are missing. And usually that prayer list is like a to-do list uh, after the prayers stop, they go find those people and do something. So the prayer is an activating uh, source of relationship is very practically sort of what happens. <clears throat> so the, the key to this is um, if you take the previous org chart with all that really astonishing large scale, uh, almost clutter of organization and capacity and pastors and roles and chaplains and volunteers. Uh, and you imagine how is that actually functioning in at social scale? Uh, the fibroblasts are a real, a real clue about how that actually works and that these are, uh, these are complex systems. Uh, so in our mind, what's going on here is not sort of a simple engagement of individuals who may be lonely or depressed or anxious for very good reasons. Um, and, but we're not, this isn't a one-on-one -on -one interventional model. This actually is a social model. So there's been lots of language in the fields of health in recent years about the social determinants. And in almost every case, the social determinants are a list of bad things that have happened to people. <clears throat> and I want you to imagine uh, the social determinants in, as including an entire positive spectrum of relationships that are moving at the same time. Uh, so social determinants for us are really biopsychosocial determinants and they are complex and active and proactive in creating relationship, uh, not and just spirit. waiting. And spiritual. And spiritual. And spiritual. Oops, mm -hmm. I left out spiritual. Okay. Next also. slide, please. <laughs> Next slide, and I'm gonna turn this over to my brilliant Thank wife. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, next slide, please. Um, continuing with the practical implications of engaging that social system complexity that Gary just described with his beautiful metaphors, um, in faith community and health system partnerships particularly, what, what role do they play? How can you engage that to, to help with people that have social isolation and loneliness? Um, in the Memphis data, as Gary said, we were in Memphis, then we came to North Carolina about 10 years ago. Um, we, we looked at trends that helped us sort of crystallize those principles or those guidelines of how faith communities and, and health system partnerships and other community partners even could kind of help people engage actively in their care, could improve health outcomes. So, for example, in the early cross-sectional data that we looked at in Memphis, the first 25 months of that data, those people that were cared for in our connected, it was called congregational health networks, um, compared to controls that did report going to churches, 90% of them did, but they were not connected churches. We found that their, their charges were about, in aggregate, about $4 million less. Um, but as we looked at the data deeper, we found that their length of stay didn't change. In Memphis at that time, length of stay was 
about over seven days. It was very long. It continues to be. And it didn't change at all during that cross-sectional study. So we figured out that people were doing something different. Maybe they were trusting. They were trusting those webs of trust that Gary were talking, was talking about. They were better educated. They were trusting the hospital system a little bit more, maybe coming earlier. So you'll see the cup there. And above it is, is actually uh, Dick Fosdick, who, who um, uh, was the the fellow that changed the way that we did the the leaping over the the bar for the Olympics and was was laughed at it when he first started that, and 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 again I think part of our focus is on thinking about not the way the hospital thinks about people coming into the hospital but the patient the person not even patient the person and their journey of health, um, and so those principles were the right door helping people come in learning more about preventive care don't come into the ED that's usually the first place that most people think about but go see a primary care doctor. Um, and that's, you know, we, we know that about $40, $40 billion or more, in, at least in the United States, is wasted on avoidable ER visits that are really not emergencies. And that's conflated, of course, with the right time. Um, we want people to recognize symptoms and issues and learn basic information about their health. So they go see a PCP if they have a sore throat or a cold or, some, or a fever that responds to meds, that they have, go to urgent care if they have a minor cut or bruise or eye injury. But they go to the ED if they have acute chest pain or they have difficulty breathing. Encouraging those people to so seek that help earlier before it becomes an acute problem. We think that was happening in Memphis, communicating, communicating across generations, focusing on wellness and not just sick care. Then ready to be treated. People need to come in with their bag of medications or their list of symptoms and patterns so that they can engage actively with their practitioner to do the best they can be in terms of of partnering. You know, IHI long ago talked about the dyad of the partner, the patient, and the provider in terms of that being more actively engaged. And that's really important and ready to be treated. But then the last one, not alone. And I think that that is the sweet spot for faith community partnerships, particularly. Um, and I think Taylor's, Tyler's uh, data really highlighted that, that faith communities you know, many people, when they get sick, they need to come for treatment. They're by themselves. They're isolated. They don't have a network of people that care for. They may feel anxious and devalued in the whole process. We know sometimes that hospital stays can be very uh, dehumanizing. But our goal for Faith Health in, in North Carolina was that people are accompanied. And the faith community language is all about walking alongside folks, someone to help them navigate and process what's going on. And we know that that's so important in care and feel that they belong, they're accepted, they're cared for. And so we're going to play now a, a little vignette about Not Alone. That was an actual experience that Wake Forest had with two elderly folks that um, unfortunately the 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 lady had hip surgery. The gentleman did not have a cell phone, got in the car. They spent the night in the car uh, and unfortunately all night long until a neighbor saw them in the car. So we're going to play this little vignette and then Gary's going to wrap this up. When Howard picked up Jane from the hospital after hip replacement surgery, everything was fine till they got home. Too frail himself to help her into the house and without a phone to call for help, they ended up spending the night in the car. When we begin a journey to health by ourselves, we can feel anxious, isolated, even distrustful, and there's nothing worse than feeling like it's us against the world. It doesn't have to be that way. Faith Health NC, a partnership of faith organizations, health providers, and community resources, gives us a network to rely on, someone to be with us before, during, and after hospitalizations, helping us create a safe, accessible home environment, volunteers who are compassionate, competent and connected, who know the way and are willing to walk the path with us. A reminder that we are not alone. Faith Health NC eases our fears and smooths out the bumps along our health care journey, even if it's just up the front porch steps. Hey, Jill, I want to hand it back to you, but just the, the hero of this story are the social networks that are already in place. And so we don't have to invent new social networks uh, because we've rediscovered the significance and ubiquity of loneliness and isolation. We already have social networks and they're already in place. We have to build alliances with those who share the values and are ready to be active. Uh, I love this line. It's not our little programs against fear, friction and disconnection. That's unnatural. The leading causes of life are pulling us actively towards each other. That's a fair fight. That's a contest that we can win. And I'm so grateful for this action forum 
for spending three days reminding us of all the things we can do, the way in which we are already related. I'm just so grateful for the work y'all have done. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gunderson and Dr. Cutts. I I love the little vignette and um, the metaphors that you use to help us. And, um, you know, the leading causes of life is just such a positive way for us to be thinking about it. So thank you so much for those wonderful insights. Um, and I will now welcome to the stage our next and final speaker in this session, Eunice Lynn Nichols. Eunice is co-CEO of Encore.org. She has spent more than two decades bringing older and younger generations together to bridge divides and solve problems, including leading Encore.org's innovation portfolio of fellowships and prizes, serving as national campaign director for the Generation to Generation Initiative, and scaling Experience Corps from one neighborhood in San Francisco into a thriving Bay Area program, helping thousands of kids read by third grade. Eunice, I'm so glad to turn it over to you. Thank you. What a privilege to be here with you all. Tyler started us off with a focus on data. Gary and Teresa talked about practice. I'm going to close this out on some interesting trends in culture and society. So as a child of Chinese immigrants, I grew up with my grandparents in my home. Multi-generational living was simply the norm. In fact, I remember the year my parents started the tradition of inviting college students from China to join us for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And every holiday, our house was filled with the sounds of four generations crowded around our table, sharing stories and Peking duck. The richness of this multi-generational community anchored my childhood in an expansive view of home. It sparked an obsession with connecting the generations that has followed me my whole career. So when I left home as a young adult, I was surprised to find it wasn't so easy for me to find that sense of extended family on my own. I don't think it's easy for anybody. In fact, modern life conspires against it. We're so busy, life is hectic, and it's often hard to venture outside a small circle of family and friends. If you throw in a global pandemic, toxic polarization, and a few natural disasters, it's no wonder our Surgeon General Vivek Murthy says we're experiencing an epidemic of loneliness. Today, I wanna to talk with you about the universal soul deep search for belonging, and more specifically, how we can create a culture of intergenerational belonging. According to a recent report from the Stanford Center on Longevity, we are living in the most age diverse society in human history with almost equal numbers of people every age from birth to 74 and beyond. But we've also simultaneously become the most age segregated nation ever with policies and practices that have put young people in schools, middle people at work and older ones often in retirement communities and nursing homes. Even spiritual communities are often bifurcated by age. Generations don't have the opportunity to connect in daily life, let alone to come together in shared purpose. Some have predicted a future characterized by misunderstanding, isolation, even generational war. But I believe our multi-generational future presents the chance to chart a very different path. Instead of being pulled apart by one crisis after another, younger and older people can choose to pull together and engage in something my organization is calling co-generation the power generated when older and younger people join forces to solve problems, bridge divides, and co-create the future. We believe so strongly in this vision, we're changing our name from Encore to Co-Generate. In fact, we're officially going live under that new banner tomorrow. A new study from University of Chicago shows that nearly all Americans believe co-generation will make life better. People want to work across generations for a sustainable planet, education, mental health care, and so much more. Guess which generation has the most enthusiasm for intergenerational connection? It's Gen Z, young people leading the way. But the research points to challenges too. Despite a desire to co-generate, most people don't know how to engage. It's like we're a society that has lost those, mu lost those muscles. We've let them atrophy. But here's the good news. We have record numbers of older generations wired to give back and record numbers of young people who are socially conscious activated and want to tackle urgent issues with older generations. They're two halves of the same coin and represent a huge opportunity if they join forces and take action together. In fact, when it comes to the problem of social isolation and loneliness, it turns out we are each other's best solution. The secret sauce is what Vivek Murthy calls the healing power of together. Nobody knows this better than a DT merchant. Aditi was a freshman at UT Austin when the entire country shut down because of the pandemic. Being separated from mentors and community made her feel helpless and alone. 
So her mind started wandering to the other adults in her life who were likely experiencing the same loneliness. Her grandmother back in Mumbai, Mr. Becker, an older neighbor she'd befriended back in high school. These cross-generational relationships had been such a source of inspiration to Aditi throughout her childhood that she began wanting that for everyone. She joined forces with two friends and launched Big and Mini, a virtual platform that combats loneliness by matching college students and older adults in meaningful and mutually beneficial conversations by video. Today, they have more than 6,000 users across the globe. And just two weeks ago, they were named a 2022 WebMD Health Hero. Co-generational housing is another path towards creating a culture of belonging. Today, record numbers of young people across the country can't find affordable rent. During the pandemic, some colleges even opened up school parking garages so unhoused students could sleep in their cars. Meanwhile, millions of spare bedrooms sit empty every night, often in the homes of older adults who live alone, struggling to maintain their houses as they age. Startups like Nesterly are creating scalable tech platforms that address the severe housing crisis and the loneliness epidemic at the same time. Through Nesterly, Brenda Atchison, an older resident in Roxbury, Massachusetts, was matched with Phoebus, an architectural student from Greece. Phoebus was eager to get reduced rent in exchange for helping out with gardening and chores. But more than that, he and Brenda found mutual companionship. Phoebus cooked Brenda Greek meals and Brenda gave him architectural tours of the neighborhood. And over food and conversation, they became fast friends. But one of my favorite stories is about five spiritually curious but religiously unaffiliated millennials who were invited into an experiment in intergenerational living at Mercy Center, a convent just a few miles from where I live. It was deeply moving to watch an older generation of nuns open up their hearts and home to pass on the gift of their true calling, their love of God and of humanity. These women knew full well that any life lessons or spiritual practices they shared would be reshaped and remixed, sometimes into completely new forms by the young people living in their midst. In the process, the community life at Mercy Center was revitalized. It became a hotbed of conversation across numerous divides. That dialogue has led to some unexpected places, including a new initiative tackling shared concerns around climate change and racial justice. If you're not convinced cogeneration is a thing yet, well, pop culture confirms the trend is catching on. Music, television, and film are all elevating a new and powerful vision for our increasingly multi-generational and multicultural society. A video went viral this summer of Brandi Carlisle with 78-year-old Joni Mitchell performing both sides now at the Newport Folk Festival. I might even go so far as to call it a spiritual experience. Nobody thought Joni would ever sing on stage again after her brain aneurysm in 2017. But Brandy's steadfast friendship helped Joni maintain connection during a deeply isolating time. Brandy would bring other young musicians over to the house for jam sessions where Joni could hum or strum along if she felt like it, or just sit and listen if she didn't. The Newport stage recreated those jam sessions with younger artists encircling Joni's big stuffed chair. That circle of belonging, safety, and acceptance is a huge part of what enabled Joni to sing once again. There wasn't a dry eye in the crowd of thousands. But these days, it's not just co-generational music that's striking a chord. Streaming shows like the Emmy award-winning Hacks and Only Murders in the Building showcase stories of older and younger colleagues and neighbors joining forces to up their career game or get the bad guys. There's also Generation Gap, a new Kelly Ripa hosted game show on ABC where grandparents and grandkids team up to compete for a pot of money. Even the Pope has his own Netflix series where filmmakers under 30 interview people over 70 about their life stories. Major Hollywood blockbusters are jumping on the co-generation train. From Disney's Lightyear to the mind-bending intergenerational epic, Everything Everywhere All at Once, which has become A24's highest grossing film of all time. Or if you have teenage boys like I do, you might have noticed that stories of aging superheroes joining forces with the next generation of superheroes have become the norm in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the audiences are loving it. Spider-Man No Way Home, which literally teams up Peter Parker with older versions of himself to save the day, became the highest grossing film of 2021 and the third highest grossing film of all time. Any guesses on the highest grossing film of 2022? Top Gun Maverick. The story, you guessed it. An aging Tom Cruise goes on a secret mission with a young pilot that requires them to work together to save the world and each other from certain disaster. But don't be fooled, the real story at the center of every one of these examples is about two socially isolated and lonely generations and their search for significance, connection, and shared purpose. 
It turns out the thorny challenges these characters face require solutions that are soul deep. And the shenanigans that ensue in between are just waypoints along the journey towards intergenerational belonging. This section on co-generation and pop culture wouldn't be complete without a shout out to Driveways. It's an independent film directed by Andrew Ahn that stars the late great Brian Dennehy in his final performance before he passed away. Dennehy plays a lonely Korean war vet who befriends an equally lonely Korean boy and his mother next door. It's a quiet but powerful film that you probably missed because it came out just as the pandemic shut theaters down. But if you watch through to Dennehy's magnificent monologue at the very end, you'll understand why it's the ultimate roadmap for intergenerational belonging and why it gets my vote for best intergenerational movie of all time. It turns out each of us has a role to play in co-generating a culture of belonging, but we need to open our eyes to see the amazing resource represented by older and younger generations right in our midst, and then feel a, liar, feel a fire lit under us to make co-generational connection and collaboration the norm. As I close out this session, I'd like to end where I started, around the dinner table. For me, growing up, intergenerational belonging started at our table with family and found family, gathering over so much more than food. The table, it turns out, is one of the best places to start building a habit of expanding our circle of concern. Encore is a collaborator in a new initiative that was launched this fall called Generations Over Dinner. It's a dinner party challenge to gather as many people from as many generations as you can over a meal. You can do it in person, you can even do it virtually over Zoom. Can you get three generations together? What about four or five? A gold star to anybody who gets six. Let's exercise those atrophied co-generational muscles and take a step towards each other. Despite the overwhelming challenges facing our world today, and there are many, I'm filled with hope because of the growing pattern of people working across generations to expand their table and create a sense of belonging for all. Let's agree to be the authors of a new story, a better story, a more powerful story about generations together. We've all been young and we're all getting older. Let's make sure we do that together. Thank you. Wow, Eunice, thank you so much. That was wonderful. We were smiling along the whole time and um, generations over dinner. I can't wait to um, accept that challenge. And I think especially with Thanksgiving and holidays coming up, it's a really great time for us to all step up to the challenge there. So thank you so much, Eunice. And thank all of our wonderful speakers in this session. Um, we really appreciate your insights on the cultural and societal themes that drive social connection and flourishing.